Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of Hiking in History. Today we are in a field as you can see, but it is not just any old field. It looks like it. It looks like a very, very normal, very boring English field. However, a great battle took place here in this field. The Battle of Blore Heath in 1459. So that is what we're going to explore today. Let's do it. So here we are, sitting in a random field, uh, by the looks of it, where the Battle of Blow Heath took place. I, I, I imagine a, a famous battle if you are um, very familiar with the War, Wars of the Roses, but uh, most people probably not very famous at all. Uh, like the, there's no museum here, um, there's not much indication that anything happened here. There's a few plaques around, uh, which we're hopefully going to find, but it is just a field. Uh, so let's just do a little bit of basic history about it. So. The Battle of Blorheath was the second major battle in the Wars of the Roses and uh, if you don't know what the Wars of the Roses were, so very generally and briefly the war, Wars of the Roses were a civil war between two cadet branches of the royal family. Now a cadet branch is it's a bit confusing to sort of wrap your head around but it's um, they're the male descendants of a monarch's younger sons. Um, so in this case it was the House of York and the House of Lancaster. They both have royal blood, they both descended from the Plantagenet family, which is the royal family that came over from France and ruled England from that, in that period in the 1400s. Now traditionally like the firstborn obviously got most of the things, got most of the titles, lands and everything, and then the people, the sons born after got less and less, which uh, as in this time caused a lot of ruckus for sure and it split a lot of families and why we had uh, the houses of York and Lancaster going at it, going after each other. So the first battle in the Wars of the Roses was the Battle of St Albans and that was in 1455 uh, and that traditionally marks like the start of the, the Wars of the Roses but after that battle there was sort of an uneasy peace, um, there was not much fighting or anything, they'd, they'd sort of settled down a bit but were very wary of each other still, very hostile to each other, even if there wasn't any full-on battles and things like that. But by 1459, so a few years later, um, they both of them had started recruiting armies again and they were very suspicious of each other, so it was it was brewing up again to really start, start again with the battles. So on the Lancastrian side there was King Henry VI um, and his Queen Margaret, and then on the Yorkish side there was Richard the Duke of York. Now Henry VI suffered very, he was, he was not a stable ruler, he suffered from bouts of madness and he was not a well guy. So his queen, Queen Margaret of Anjou, I think that's how you pronounce it, Anjou, it's a Fre French name, she oftentimes ruled in his stead, you know, she was kind of pulling all the strings, she was often like fully in charge of leading and uh, getting armies together, all the rest of it, you know. Um, and she was the one that was raising support, started raising support again for her husband um, in 1459 and the years leading up to that. But still, Richard the Duke of York, he was finding also a lot of support as well, for anti-royal support. Um, so he was also gathering his armies up north. And that was even despite, obviously, severe punishment if anyone if you were found you know conspiring against the king against the monarchy um, it was death so he was still finding support even under those circumstances now the main Yorkist force were all based in Middle Middleham Castle which is in Yorkshire uh, they were led by the Earl of Salisbury which is a, an important guy in this story the army was led by him the Earl of Sal Salisbury um, but what he needed to do, he needed to link up. They had two armies, what the main one up the, up the north, and then and there was one in Ludlow Castle, which is in Shropshire. And he needed to link these armies up, get them both together. 
So the Earl of Salisbury leading this, this army marched down from Yorkshire and all through the Midlands to link up with the second army at Ludlow Castle. Now Queen Marjorie of Anjou got wind of this, knew this was uh, happening and uh, she ordered one of her lords, Lord Audley, also an uh, important guy in this story. Um, he was the commander of her army. Uh, she ordered him to intercept the Yorkist army that was marching down to meet at Ludlow Castle. Now Lord Audley was from around these parts and he chose Blore Heath, this spot, uh, for his ambush, for the waiting for the Yorkist army to come through here to try and meet up to, to, at the, with the other men at Ludlow Castle. Uh, and this is where he chose to pitch his fight. And this was, back then this was again, just a barren sort of farmland area, not a lot here, it still isn't a lot here. Uh, let's give some context where whereabouts it is. We're like two miles east of Market Drayton, so Market Drayton is down that way. And then it's actually closer to the village of Loggerheads, which is just that way. Um, so it's sort of in between Loggerheads and Market Drayton. And Blore Heath is just up there, the official sort of very small little village and uh, farms just dotted around here. So Lord Audley chose this spot uh, for his ambush. So and it was on the 23rd of September 1459, uh, where 10,000 of his men, supposedly, the, the one thing that's always hard with some of these battles is numbers. You get different numbers for casualties and the amount of men, all that kind of stuff. So I've had a look on a few, a couple of websites, like two or three websites, and this, all this stuff is basically kind of the same, apart from um, the numbers. So if anyone wants to correct me on things, absolutely do. Um, I just had a look at a few websites and this was seemed to be the general story that all of them said. Um, the Wikipedia one is pretty much right, so if you wanted to look it up and research it yourself as well, it seems that the Wikipedia is actually like it, it's it's correct by the by other websites. Um, but yes, so supposedly ten thousand men were in his army, Lord Audley's army for the uh, Lancastrians, and they were camped. They hid behind a, what they called a great hedge, which probably is not here anymore, obviously. It probably would have been a further back here somewhere. Um, a lot taller than these hedges. This one, I imagine, was probably not here at all. Um, I, yeah, I highly doubt that, because obviously this is all farmland now that uh, I probably shouldn't be on, really, but, you know. Um, yeah, the, a lot of these hedges probably were not here back then. Uh, but there was a, gr a really big hedge, probably further back there, and they hid behind there, waiting for the Yorkist army to come from this way, come down. Because you can't see it here because of all these trees, this tree cover. But it slopes down here, as you can see, slopes down, and it does on the opposite side. And in the middle here, which you can't see because of the trees, but there is a small brook of water just flowing through here. So the Yorkists were on that side, Lancastrians were on this side, hidden probably further away there, waiting for the Yorkists to appear over the hills. Now this is quite a humorous little bit, but as the Yorkists were coming down here, uh, down the, the other side of this hill, uh, their scouts could easily see the Lancastrian banners that were popping over the great <laughs> the great hedge. So that huge hedge that they were hiding behind, um, they weren't the smartest that day because they had all their banners up and the banners were poking out over the hedge. So the Yorkists coming down could see that there was an army waiting for them. Uh, so that probably wasn't the best. Now, the Yorkists only had around about 5,000 troops. So that's 5,000 versus 10,000. That is not good odds. Um, and as the Yorkists came down, they noticed, they saw that they were vastly outnumbered. Um, but instead of fleeing, retreating or anything like that, uh, the Earl of Salisbury, he straight away organised battle positions, you know, everyone to dig in battle positions and the, he got his wagons to sort of surround one side of the army so they couldn't be flanked and protect them all across here, which we can't see very well because of the trees. 
Uh, the Yorkist soldiers as well were supposedly it is said that they they all kissed the ground because they were so they knew they were so outnumbered and they thought they were definitely going to die in this battle uh, that would inevitably take place. Um, they were out of reach of uh, archery fire though from the Lancastrians. The um, Earl of Salisbury made sure that his army was far enough back that uh, arrow fire couldn't hit them. It's said that the two armies were separated by about 300 metres and uh, it was very barren back then as well it said so. Even these trees possibly were maybe not here uh, back then, there was just the brook it says, um, maybe a bit of foliage and stuff like that but it might not have been as grown as it is here because this, I imagine a lot of this has been planted over the hundreds of years to sort of separate and um, you know partition off sections of land uh, for farming and stuff like that so it was quite just barren but it dipped down here there's a brook and then the Yorkists were over that side um, it's like in most medieval battles they uh, did actually attempt to negotiate and parlay and uh, make sure that there wasn't any bloodshed but that didn't work negotiations fell through but the Yorkists were in a tricky position because they only had 5,000 men versus 10,000 on the other side they had to get to Ludlow Castle, there was no way around, they were stuck. Um, if they were to advance and attack it would be absolute suicide. So they were sort of just trapped. So as the battle began it started uh, just with archery, with longbows firing at each other. Um, there were some casualties in this but it, it doesn't seem to be that, doesn't seem like were, it was particularly effective for either side. Um, Possibly um, better for the Yorkists, they actually killed more than the Lancastrians did, but it wasn't a massive um, difference or anything like that. But that's how the, the battle started. Um, but Salisbury knew it would be suicide if he if he attacked, so so the Earl of Salisbury used his noggin and he ordered a fake retreat. Uh, so he told some of his men to pretend to retreat away so it looked like his army was retreating over and then of course the Lancastrians saw this thought they were retreating thought they were going to have them on the run and um, Lord Audley uh, ordered a cavalry charge because he had a lot of cavalry with his army where the Yorkists had some cavalry but not a lot uh, so they charged down here all the horses all the cavalry charged down this into the brook and of course that is exactly where the Earl of Salisbury wanted the Lancastrian army down here trying to cross the brook which um, was quite fast flowing it said back then and quite wide so I think it's a lot smaller now but you can't even see it anyway well I'll well, hopefully try to get some shots of it soon because uh, we're going to go over to a different part try to anyway because there is a monument that's supposedly I think it's literally just over here uh, so I'm going to try somehow to get to it but so the Lancastrian cavalry came all down here you can see it sloping down now down this way and then trying to cross the brook which would have been slow going and of course the Earl of Salisbury then told his army to attack it wasn't an actual retreat of course it was just a fake retreat so the Yorkists then attacked the cavalry trying to cross the brook and they were then at a severe disadvantage and uh, the Lancastrians were, a lot of them were killed, a lot of the cavalry was wiped out. Seeing this, the, uh, the Lancastrians retreated but then made a second attack, tried to go again. Um, it's thought to possibly actually um, rescue, rescue wounded. Uh, they launched a second attack once again which was more successful than the first one. Um, a decent number of the Lancastrians made it over the brook and um, this was the period of most intense fighting which it's crazy to think literally just right here just, just over the brook on the next hill and all all across here uh, the most intense fighting happened and Lord Audley himself was in the thick of it and he was killed during this. And there is just over on the other side there should be because we're going to try and find it hopefully fingers crossed there is a cross on the spot where Lord Audley died, who was commanding the Lancastrians. And uh, this 
was kind of like a turning point in the battle of course the commander was dead and the it then fell to a, another lord lord dudley to command the lancastrian army but seeing their commander obviously die that's a big blow to morale uh, but then it was lord dudley who was in charge and he ordered another attack they they, they really were trying to push but they, they got some success with the second attack they were over there they were still but they were suffering heavy casualties both sides were at this point but the lancastrians more so um they, they had the devastating cavalry charge and then they were still suffering very heavy losses during the second attack even if they were making progress um but then lord audley ordered another attack straight away after uh, lord audley had died uh, with some 4,000 men it is said and this was also a failure you know trying to get over the brook they, they they couldn't they couldn't get through fully um it was too tough going and at this point something kind of crazy happens is that uh, supposedly anyway this is what it's what it says there's a helicopter going around here so excuse the noise but uh, supposedly 500 of the Lancastrian army, the men, actually turned and switched sides and just started attacking their own, started attacking the, the, the Lancastrian army and were with the Yorkists at that point, which is a crazy thing, I, like, I've never heard of that really before, mid-battle just switching sides and actually not, all, not even surrendering but fully attacking your own side. Um, and at this point it was all over, you know, the, it was, the, the Lancastrians were routed and that rout uh, lasted through the night. The whole battle lasted, I think, a few hours, like three or four hours, uh, but then through the whole night they were routed across the countryside and the Yorkists were just following them, picking them off, dealing as many casualties as they can. And that all happened here, so you would never think but almost around about 2,000 Lancastrians were killed during that battle and around 1,000 Yorkists so a, a clear decisive victory for the Yorkists of course but heavy casualties on both sides um, but an amazing victory really when you think about it, it seems that they were outnumbered double you know 5,000 versus 10,000 um, and the casualties reflect that they're, they're just the opposite way around you know 1,000 Yorkists 2,000 Lancastrians dead um, an amazing victory for the Yorkists though. But it's incredible to think that that literally happened here. That much death happened here. Um, and you can't, you just can't imagine because it, it, it looks, it looks so peaceful now and it's just a beautiful area. But all that happened just here, all along here. What's probably fascinating and interesting is if, you know, you could probably find artefacts still, probably buried under here. Um, you know, if you come here with a metal detector, you might, maybe you could get some cool stuff. But no doubt there will be piece, little pieces of armour, metal, broken swords and God knows what. Um, horseshoes. I'm just spitballing here, but, you know, if, you, if they excavated all this, there, there would still be things under here. Uh, from over 550 years ago this, this battle happened and now it's just this peaceful place and again I always say but that's one of the amazing things about England and I mean most countries in Europe and stuff like that but you've just got random fields that no one ever goes to no one ever talks about really anymore um, yeah there's a great story behind it you know, an incredible battle took place here. And what's also especially cool about this battle and this one uh, is obviously it's the War of the Roses and the 14, 15th century, so 1459. Um, and this was a period where this sort of classic image of a knight, you know, a knight in armour, that classic Hollywood image, you almost think, of, you know, the full suit of armour. Um, but that's actually how it was. For It was a very brief period uh, in English history where those knights were actually around with the full set of armour. They were the first tanks really, you know, the, you think of the, the tank being invented in World War I um, and being deployed at the Battle of the Somme for the first time. 
but really um, obviously that was an engineering a, a tank but the first tanks really were those men in the full suits of armor those knights um, because Hollywood and films and all that that stuff they never they rarely depict it in the realistic way of because uh, if you read about it you know these things were heavy like unbelievably heavy um, so heavy that if you if you fell over in in your full suit of knight's armor and, mo and normal soldiers didn't wear these these were you know knights these were proper soldiers um, that wore these fully tanked out suits of armor um, if you fell over during the battle um, you were not getting up like they, you could not get up without being assisted by at least two men and men died in their suits of armor simply from suff suffocating from the weight of it uh, if they fell over uh, you had a you know <laughs> there was a fair chance that you would literally just die because the weight would just cr suffocate uh, be on your, your lungs on your chest would just suffocate you. so it's something as simple as falling over could kill you uh, if you were in one of those those suits of armor you got to think you know then they were on horses and the mud everything like that I mean this was the battle happened in September time so end of summer really so it, it might have still kind of looked like this probably a bit more it's heading into autumn at that point isn't it so a bit colder probably um, probably a bit less foliage uh, there was a big wood apparently um, I don't know on which side but there was a lot more trees I've heard probably maybe where the hedge was and maybe over that side as well um, but all these little hedges were definitely not here and um, I would imagine that the, the tree cover here was probably a lot less maybe nothing uh, otherwise because Otherwise, the armies wouldn't really be able to see each other uh, coming over the hills and stuff like that, which they supposedly could, and they could see the banners over the hedges and stuff like that. So I imagine all this was a lot less. And another thing about the, those tanks, those suits of armor, is that they, they really were tanks in the way that uh, they were obviously very slow to move and all the rest, but they, they were practically impenetrable. Um, arrows and things like that, um, you, you sort of see again in Hollywood, um, lots of these, uh, lots of men wearing like armor and stuff like that, and arrows kind of just go through the metal and stuff anyway, and swords can sort of go through and break. That would not happen. Um, that would likely not happen at all. Arrows would more than likely just bounce off um, because it was thick, thick steel, I believe, that it would be made out of. It's thick armor, whatever it was made out of. And um, arrows would simply just bounce off you. You were impenetrable you were pretty safe from danger now that doesn't mean that arrows wouldn't hurt you got a load of arrows hitting you like you're gonna feel them it's it's gonna be noisy as hell in, in your suit of armor I mean you're gonna feel it but they will they would not penetrate um, that armor you would be safe probably being maybe the equivalent of being like hit with a paintball gun possibly you know, it would hurt but you're not gonna sustain any major injury and um, unless you know there's probably specific little parts where maybe all, you know an arrow could get through uh, on the connecting joints because it was a very meticulous uh, quite a beautiful thing that was made these sets of armor um, how they connected all together so there was the there would have been weak spots where um, you know swords and all the rest could get through and could cut through um, but you were pretty impenetrable and pretty safe in there um, even with swords again like someone comes at you and whacks you with a sword like it's it's not going to cut through that armor um they would have to find again a weak spot maybe like under the arm and stuff like that um a lot of the times these these uh, knights and stuff were killed simply because they fell over and they could then easily you know be attacked on the ground um you know the weak spots so they'd often open the visors and just like get a dagger and just stab it through the visor so just straight in the eye straight in the face um, just, just simply because you could wail on these these men in these armor and they wouldn't die um, the more effective would probably be like a blunt instrument like maces and things like that um, just to, to cave in the armor um, which again would it would suffocate you know the, the men inside would suffocate with the armor caving in on them uh, but yes, enough about armour. 
we are going to try and find Audley's Cross, which is the spot where the Lancastrian commander Audley died, supposedly. So let's see if we can have a look down here and we're going to try cross over and get in there. So that is this field anyway where the battle took place. Uh, we're going to have a look for Audley's Cross as well, where the cross where the Lancastrian commander died. Hopefully we can get up there because it's got an inscription on it and that cross is even really old. It wasn't put up at the time, it's not 550 years old, but it was put up in the 1700s so it's a long time ago still. We're going to try to get over there, but there is also there is a rabbit here as well, I don't know if you can see. <laughs> Being distracted by rabbits, because these fields literally no one's in. Uh, oh there he is, hello, it's getting quite close. Is turning into a wildlife documentary. There you go, off he goes. You realise that, it's like, oh crap, there is a person here. Um, yes, okay, so what was I saying? Oh yes, legend has it as well that Queen Margaret was actually nearby here watching the battle. Uh, so again, off the um, Lancastrian side. Uh, the legend says that she was watching the battle from a church tower in a, a very small village called Mucklestone which is nearby, fairly nearby. I think it's over that way. This, uh, this small village, it's got a church in there. Church in the village, and she was supposedly watching the battle from this church tower in Mucklestone. And um, she obviously saw her army get decimated um, and then fled um, once she saw that the battle was clearly not won. And now we're gonna try and go to there too, because that's got an interesting thing, is that a part of this legend is that when she fled from this church tower, she had the local uh, blacksmith um, reshoe her horse, but in the opposite way or ups upside down or something like that. She she got him to do do something with the horseshoes that would disguise her her tracks essentially. So and that anvil is still there by the church. So we're going to try and find that because uh, that's a cool one, legend. I like that. Well, yes, let's first, let's see if we can get to Audley's Cross, which is just there. Uh, so here we are, we found the brook. This is the brook that goes running through the, all the fields. It's just full of trees and stuff now, but um, I think it was wide about then because it's described at the time as being quite wide and fast flowing. Uh, but either way, you know, if it, even if it was like this, you know, if the, when cavalry and armies have got to try and get through something like this it slows them down and that's when the Yorkists came down and attacked them um, crazy just to think about you know really how many people died in around this area we're going to try and cross this maybe and then hopefully we can make a way up because Audley's Cross is literally just up there oh my god I've made it here it is the things I do for these videos I've just crawled all the way up here there's an embankment, barbed wire and metal, so yeah, it's safe to say that it is just a farm that you shouldn't be on, but, you know, I'm not disturbing anything, so it's, oh well, come and arrest me, I guess. Here it is, Lord Audley's Cross, so this marks the spot, supposedly, where he fell, where Lord Audley was the last. Lancastrians died right here. Not very far from the brook at all, just down there where them bushes and that are. And there's the field where we were, to the opposite side. And this is obviously where the Yorkists were and they came charging down to attack the Lan Lancastrians as they were crossing the brook. Here it is, literally just in a farmer's field, completely forgotten, as you can tell, just the state of it. Strange that they've put this around it though. Um, maybe at one time people you could visit it. Uh, but this was put up in the 1700s and as you can see it's just left now. I'm completely forgotten. There is an inscription. You can you can not even get in because it's that it's that worn and that now. There's no way I can read it anyway. Um, it's very worn now. I have seen pictures of it online though so I'll do a voiceover and read the inscription because 
and there was there's pictures of it from the 1970s where it's still very warm but you can actually read it the road is literally right here it's so close to the, the main road um, but yeah this is where he fell completely forgotten history that's what i love about i love finding this these kind of things and researching them hopefully that is partly what this channel is about as well completely forgotten history that no one's doing videos on this the Battle of Blue Heath and Audley's Cross in a beautiful resting area now I imagine he he wouldn't mind probably being remembered here very occasionally by the the odd odd person so he didn't make it that far he didn't make it that far up the up the brook when they were attacking so we're going to try and head to Mucklestone now, which is down that way, which is interesting because this is where obviously the Yorkists came from, but in the legend, uh, the Queen was uh, watching from Mucklestone, which is that way, so she must have seen them come past and then watched all this happen from here. Uh, yeah, it's over that way, we're going to try to get to there. Um, but yeah, once they were routed, the Lancastrians and the Yorkists followed them up here all round uh, for the rest of the night, taking them out, killing them. Uh, they settled for the night near Market Drayton uh, on a hill which is now called Salisbury Hill after the Earl of Salisbury. Um, and I was thinking of maybe visiting there as well, but I probably won't because there isn't actually anything there. There's, I don't think there's any plaques or anything, and it's actually just the golf course now. It's a Market Drayton golf course. Um, so there isn't really anything there, but that is where they camped overnight after the victory. Uh, at the Battle of Blue Heath, but for now let's head to Mucklestone and see that church. Just on the way to the church now, but it's a good view of the field here because it's just there, that one there, where I was standing. So it just dips down. But obviously the Yorkists would have marched here. They probably would have been around about where I'm standing, really, right by the road, because I don't, I, I don't know exactly. I don't know exactly how far 300 meters is, but that, that's probably about 300 meters, right? Something like that to that that field over there. So um, when they said it, they were 300 meters apart from each other, you know, their army was probably just on there, and then the Yorkists were all along here, and they had the the wagons all surrounding them, so they couldn't be outflanked. And then they were doing the archery firing, and then pretending to retreat. Saw them moving down. And then they all just charged. Incredible, it's just it all just happened right here. On my way to the church now, look at this. <laughs> Beware of tick infest infestation in this wood. Pets and owners have been bitten and have contracted Lyme disease. So, great, I might just end up with Lyme disease going through here. Here we are, Mucklestone. The church is just up here. So here we are, this is the church, St. Mary's at Mucklestone. So this is where Margaret, Margaret of Anjou, watched the battle from right up on top of there, around that tower. I've had a, a try go in, unfortunately it is closed at the moment, so can't have a look inside. We won't be able to see what she saw from up there, but this is the church, which is pretty special. Very nice little village here teeny tiny little village but lovely church but it's nice inside as well i can see the anvils over there as well but let's have a little walk around because this is where the legend has it that she watched watched the battle from on top of here uh whether it's 100 percent true or not we don't know but i like to believe these things these things are, are cool Okay, this looks old. It's probably around when she was around. Uh, it's a nice little graveyard here. Uh, quite modern ones, these ones. But there's some old tombs as well, hanging about. And 
here is the anvil. The anvil that was used there came from the smithy when it was demolished and believed to have been used by William Skelhorn in 1459. So he is the smithy that he's the smithy that had the Queen's uh, horseshoes reversed so she could escape without anyone following her. And that is the anvil supposedly that was used. And literally opposite is this. This is the cottage. Uh, that used to be the smithy now, so it's called Smithy Cottage now, but it says here On this site stood the smithy of William Skelhorn, at which Queen Margaret had her horseshoes reversed to aid her escape from the Battle of Blore Heath, 23rd of September 1459 We don't know if it's true 100% but I like to believe it, I think that's a really cool story in a beautiful little area and that's where she watched the battle from Most people just pass through here. It's literally this is it. It's just it's a tiny few little cottages and houses, and that is all there is to Mockingstone. But yeah, beautiful. I bet that I'd like to go inside one time because I bet it's nice in there. So I've just come on top of the anvil here, and you can see there's a horseshoe on it as well. One of the reversed horseshoes. Oh, unless someone someone's put it here. I thought it was nailed to it. That's cool. I think someone's left that here. So maybe that's what they did. She. The blacksmith did that so to disguise her tracks on the way. That's really cool. I'll leave that there. And there's some little inscriptions on the side, just the memory of the just is bliss. And peace, perfect peace. But there is the anvil. Incredible that it's still here. Uh, that is it from Mucklestone. That is the story of the Battle of Blow Heath. Really interesting story. Uh, I love uh, the little legend part to it as well, right here in the church. Um, it's a shame, I'd love to be able to go up to the top and be able to see what she saw, Queen Margaret of Anjou. Because I bet you get a great view up there. You could be able to see where the, the field was. And yeah, no wonder she shot herself when she saw him get absolutely decimated and then had her horseshoes reversed and fleed. But yes, that was the story of the Battle of Blow Heath. Hopefully you enjoyed it. It's the first battlefield one I've ever done. I'd like to do more. Uh, but yeah, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. Like and subscribe, all that good YouTube-y stuff. Because uh, there'll be more videos coming. And I'll see you in whatever the next one will be. Bye.